Hello and welcome to today's webinar, Evaluating Urban Arterial Reliability Performance Metrics. My name is Brendan Williams. I am the Research Program Administrator at Portland State University's Transportation Research and Education Center. TREC leads the National Institute for Transportation and Communities, one of seven national university transportation centers funded by the U.S. Department of Transportation. NITSI consortium members are the University of Arizona, University of Oregon, University of Utah, University of Texas at Arlington, and Oregon Institute of Technology. NITSI's research priority is improving mobility of people and goods to build strong communities. Our webinars on the latest NITSI funded projects feature faculty, researchers, and students. It is our goal to provide you with usable research results. We appreciate your feedback. Our speaker today is Dr. Jason Anderson. Jason is a research associate at Portland State University. His presentation is based on a recently completed NITSI research project. There is additional information on our website, including the final report. Jason's current areas of research include transportation safety modeling, spatial econometrics and statistics, and big data analysis. He is especially interested in emerging technologies and data fusion techniques related to smart vehicles, infrastructure, cities, and their impacts on safety. Okay, give me a moment to promote our upcoming events. Um, this Friday, we have Zhang Ho Chang from the city of Seattle. He will be presenting on Building Healthy Communities Through Seattle's Growth Policy. All of our Friday transportation seminars are recorded and available to watch online. Our next webinar is on December 3rd with Dr. Stephen Ficus and Dr. Mark Schlossberg from the University of Oregon. They will be presenting on Letting Bike Riders Catch the Green Wave. All right, a brief over, uh, overview of the webinar. Uh, Jason is gonna present for about 40 minutes. During the presentation, please submit your questions via the GoToWebinar control panel. There's a questions section, um, and we'll be able to use those questions at the end, the last 15 minutes for a Q&A. We are recording today's webinar and we will make it available on our website. You will receive an email with a link to the video recording and presentation slides. If you are tracking professional development hours, this webinar is eligible for one hour of continuing education credit. Instructions on how to redeem the credit will be included in your post webinar email. All right, and with that, I'm going to hand it over to Jason. Thank you, Brendan, for that introduction. Um, I'm Jason, as Brendan said, a research associate with Portland State University. And today I'll be talking about travel time reliability metrics on urban arterials, as well as the effects of specific time related variables or factors on average travel time and travel time variability. As was mentioned, Today's webinar is based off a project that we completed earlier this year titled Understanding Factors Affecting Arterial Reliability Performance Metrics. Therefore, the structure of today's webinar will follow the structure of the report. I'd also like to add if today's webinar is of specific interest to you, I encourage you to visit the Trek website and download the report. Let's go ahead and get started. So for this project, why Portland, Oregon and why arterials? Based off of 2018 NRICS data in Portland, Oregon, there were 116 hours lost in congestion per capita. 
These hours spent in congestion resulted in an approximate cost per driver of $1,625 and a $1.4 billion cost incurred by the city of Portland. Surprisingly, these statistics are the same as San Francisco. Now I'm from the Bay Area, and when I first moved to Oregon, I didn't quite understand the fuss being made about Portland area traffic. However, in recent years, I have also begun to quote unquote, complain of Portland traffic. That said, however, I now have the statistics to back this up. Now, if you're familiar with the Portland area, a lot of these congestion statistics are a result of interstate related congestion. In the Portland area, this would include I-5, I-84, I-205, and I-405. Although these interstates account for a large proportion of congestion, so do arterials. Once more, if you're familiar with the area, examples of highly congested arterials can include Tualatin Valley Highway, Murray Boulevard, Shoals Ferry Road, Tualatin Sherwood Road, and Oregon 99. Now, although arterials are contributing to congestion and travel time delays, interstates and freeways remain the primary focus of travel time related research. Therefore, the focus of this project and this study uh, was to address solely travel time on urban arterials. This was accomplished through six specific steps. The first being data collection and corridor selection. <clears throat> the second, an outlier analysis. Third, a median based travel time analysis. Four and five are the assessment of travel time reliability metrics as recommended by the Federal Highway Administration on one, the corridor level, and two, a segment level analysis. And then lastly, number six is to determine significant temporal factors on average travel time and travel time variability, as well as the ability to quantify their effects. So as I just mentioned, <clears throat> The first step was to collect data and identify corridors to be considered for analysis. Data collection was made possible by Washington County in Oregon, so I'd like to quickly thank them for their assistance and access to the data. Over the past few years, Washington County has installed various blue Mac devices at various intersections throughout the county that use Bluetooth detectors to measure travel time. So as mobile devices move within a specified distance of the Bluetooth detector, the detector identifies and timestamps the Bluetooth MAC address. Then as successive detections across a corridor are made, travel time can be determined. As of the time of the report, Washington County had approximately 135 of these devices located at various intersections. Our job was to select Bluetooth detectors of interest through a web portal provided by Washington County. For selection, we used two primary requirements. One was that the selected detectors must be on corridors that have similar traffic volumes. The second was that there must be an adequate number of observations or an adequate number of travel time records. Also, considering the scope of the project, we limited the number of corridors to be considered for analysis to just three. This required checking all detectors for data availability. After this process, it was determined that four months consistently had a large number of travel time records, August 2017 to November 2017. After selecting these corridors, the Bluetooth detectors through the web portal will then use to match trips along the corridor. Here's a screenshot of what the portal looks like in the various Bluetooth detectors around Washington County. So to get the data, we would select one detector, select a second detector, and the web portal would then match trips and generate a data set for us to download. Now, as I stated previously, three corridors were selected for analysis. So let us take a look at those. The first corridor considered was Oregon 99. This segment is 3.56 miles long and surrounded by various land use types, including industrial, farm use, agricultural, and forest and rural residential. There are eight traffic signals along this segment, along with eight northbound transit stops and seven southbound transit stops. The second corridor considered was Tualatin Sherwood Road. This is a primary arterial between Oregon 99 and Interstate 5. This corridor is 4.66 miles long and surrounded according to Washington County land use maps by a single land use type, industrial. There are 18 traffic signals along with 12 eastbound transit stops and 10 westbound transit stops. Additionally, this corridor had the highest percentage of freight related vehicles, Federal Highway Class 9 and greater, relative to the total average annual daily traffic. 
The third corridor considered was Tualatin Valley Highway. This segment is 6.42 miles long and is surrounded by various land use types, again, including industrial, commercial, business, neighborhood commercial, residential, and institutional. There are 18 traffic signals along this segment, along with 23 eastbound transit stops and 24 westbound transit stops. So now that we've identified the corridors for analysis and selected the corresponding travel time records, the next step was to detect and remove outliers. Several different outlier detection methods were considered, but we elected to adopt a median-based outlier detection method. The selection of this method stems from distributional assumptions that lie within the majority of traditional outlier detection methods. Therefore, the equations you see here is based on the median. The outlier detection method was then applied on 15 minute blocks of travel time. If we look at this equation, uppercase M refers to the median travel time within each 15 minute block. TT is the travel time observed on the eighth trip, and then lowercase M is the number of trips within each block of travel time. Now the value three you see here is based on previous research where three was determined to be the most effective value in identifying outliers. Additionally, this procedure is applied separately within each 15 minute block based on the median within that 15 minute block. In regards to consideration of high outliers, all outliers are based only on the median based outlier analysis. In other words, due to data availability, rare events such as crashes, work zones, et cetera, causing extreme travel times could not be identified. The reliability analysis was conducted for three specific time groups, weekdays, weekends, and holidays that occurred over the four month period of data that we had. Therefore, the outlier detection analysis was conducted on each of these data sets independently. So here we have a graphical output um, for one of the corridors <clears throat> uh, for weekdays and weekends, specifically to Allerton Valley Highway <clears throat> in the eastbound direction. The red dots indicate an outlier, while the blue dots indicate accurate, accurate travel time uh, records based on the equation that we've just seen. Of note, the majority of outliers are on extreme travel times, most likely attributed to drivers making stops along the corridor, say for shopping, getting gas, etc then the Bluetooth detector matches their Bluetooth address once they've started traveling again. Now to show the importance of accounting for outliers and how it affects the descriptive statistics, here is a before and after example on Tualatin Valley Highway in the eastbound direction. The number of trips have decreased by more than 2,000, about 15%. The average travel time has decreased by more than three minutes, about 16%. The median has decreased by 41 seconds, just by 4%. The standard deviation has decreased by nearly six minutes, about 60% decrease, and each of the considered percentiles have decreased, with the largest decreases observed for the 85th and 95th percentile travel times. Now, although I've only shown a single corridor in a single direction um, in today's webinar, similar decreases were observed on each corridor in each direction and for each time group considered weekdays, weekends, and holidays. The primary difference between those time groups was observed during the holidays in which the decrease in the number of trips were consistently greater compared to weekdays and weekends. After the outlier detection, the median travel time analysis was then conducted. So for the median travel time analysis, we analyzed five minute median travel times for weekdays, weekends, and holidays separately, and then identified trends in the peak hours. After removing the outliers, the median travel times for five minute intervals were determined for each corridor in each direction. For the intervals with no data, the travel times were set to zero for graphical identification and to avoid errors during calculations. Tukey's smoothing tool in the statistical software R was applied to the median curves of all the corridors to help distinguish the peaks more clearly. Um, for holiday plots, I refer you to the report as I'll only be showing you the uh, weekdays and weekend plots in today's webinar. 
Within each day, the following time periods were considered. 6 a.m. to 10 a.m., which we deemed as morning, 10 a.m. to 3 p.m., which we called midday, and 3 p.m. to 7 p.m., which we called evening. So the plots that you've been looking at here show variations in five-minute median travel times over Tualatin Valley Highway in the east and westbound directions for both weekdays and weekends. During the weekdays, there are two peaks, a sharp morning peak and a broad evening peak. In the eastbound direction, there are travel times during the morning peak around 7 a.m. is higher, whereas in the westbound direction, the evening peak between 5 p.m. and 6 p.m. is more pronounced. In the westbound direction on weekdays, the travel times during midday becomes higher than the morning peak, whereas on weekends, the travel times gradually increase and decrease with the highest travel times observed between 12 p.m. and 2 p.m. in both directions. So considering the median travel time analysis still, these plots show the five minute median travel time variations on Tualatin Sherwood Road. During the weekday in the eastbound direction, travel times show a sharp morning peak and a broad peak covering midday and evening with the highest travel times observed between 2 p.m. and 3 p.m. On weekdays in the westbound direction, there are three distinct peaks throughout each time period, morning, midday, and evening, each of increasing magnitude. On weekends, the travel times gradually increase and decrease, again, with the highest travel times observed between 12 p.m. and 2 p.m. in both directions, which is the same trend we saw on Tualatin Valley Highway for weekends. For the last corridor, Oregon 99, here are the variations of travel times based on the median. In both the northbound and southbound directions on weekdays, the evening peak dominates. On weekdays, there is a smaller morning peak in the northbound direction, whereas no morning peak is observed in the southbound direction. This is the direction headed away from Portland. The fluctuations are lower on Oregon 99 compared to the previous two corridors. And once again, on weekends, we see the travel times gradually increase and decrease with the highest times observed between noon or 12 p.m. and 2 p.m. in both directions. So after having removed outliers and conducting a median travel time analysis, we conducted the travel time reliability analysis. <clears throat> this was done based on three reliability metrics as recommended by the Federal Highway Administration. The first of these was the buffer index, defined as the 95th percentile travel time minus the mean travel time then divided by the mean travel time. The second reliability metric was the normalized standard deviation. This is defined as the standard deviation of travel time divided by the free flow travel time, where free flow travel time is the time required to travel the segment while moving at free flow speed. To determine free flow travel time, we used a free flow speed equal to five miles per hour greater than the posted speed limit. The selection of this value was based on previous research. Theoretically, other free flow speeds can be assumed where the results would just be scaled based on the value of that assumption. Then with each corridor having different posted speed limits at different locations along the corridor, the free flow travel time was calculated for each of these segments separately and then estimated by summing the free flow travel times of all segments across the corridor. The final reliability metric considered was the planning index. Planning index is defined as the 95th percentile travel time divided by the free flow travel time. So using these reliability metrics, the reliability analysis again was conducted for weekdays, weekends, and holidays on each corridor in each direction. Let's take a look at some of the results. So here are the overall reliability results by corridor and direction. Each statistic was calculated for 15 minute time intervals from 6 a.m. to 7 p.m. and averaged to get the overall statistic for each corridor. The higher the value, the lower the travel time reliability. As we can see of the selected corridors, Tualatin Sherwood Road has the lowest reliability. Additionally, for both Tualatin Valley Highway and Tualatin Sherwood Road, 
the eastbound directions have slightly higher reliability compared to their westbound counterparts. Oregon 99 has the highest reliability among the three corridors, with the northbound direction having a marginally higher reliability. Of note, of the corridors that head to downtown Portland, the higher reliability is in the direction headed to the city of Portland. This table provides the mean values of all the reliability metrics across all 15 minute time intervals between 6 a.m. and 7 p.m. for weekdays, weekends, and holidays across each corridor considered. Twelfth and Sherwood's westbound corridor has the lowest reliability, and Oregon 99's northbound corridor has the highest reliability across weekdays, weekends, and holidays. For both Twelfth and Sherwood Road and Oregon 99, weekend reliability is higher than weekdays according to all three reliability metrics, which is expected. However, Tualatin Valley Highway is the only corridor where travel time reliability on weekdays is more than weekends, and this is based on the buffer index and the normalized standard deviation. However, when we look at the planning index, weekends are more reliable than weekdays. As for holidays, in general, they are more reliable than any other day, which is also to be expected. The table you see here presents the correlation between all three metrics, where BI stands for buffer index and S for normalized standard deviation and PI for planning index. Based on these metrics, the normalized standard deviation and planning index have strong positive correlations. The buffer and planning index have lower but positive correlations. Now, since the planning index uses percentiles, which is more outlier resistant, from this point forward, we proceeded with using the planning index as the basis for analysis. Also, we directed more focus on weekdays and weekends for further analysis, as travel times on holidays are, in general, more reliable. So if we just consider the planning index, these figures depict the variation and in planning index for each 15-minute interval for weekdays and weekends across all corridors. The figures clearly show that Tualatin Sherwood Road has the lowest reliability across nearly all time periods, specifically during weekdays. Tualatin Sherwood Road are the center two rows in these two plots, the, the very dark colored uh, rectangles. The morning period has the highest reliability for all three corridors across all time periods. The midday period is the least reliable for all three corridors during the weekends. Uh, which we also saw in the median analysis in which travel times were much higher during that time period. During the weekdays, Tualatin Valley Highway, the evening period has the lowest travel time reliability in the eastbound direction, and the midday and evening periods are worse in terms of reliability in the westbound direction. On Oregon 99, the evening period is the least reliable on weekdays. We can also see that the northbound direction of Oregon 99 has better reliability than the southbound direction, both for weekdays and weekends, with the difference being a bit more pronounced on weekdays. The table you see now provides the mean planning index value for each corridor and each day of the week individually. Similar to what was observed in the earlier analyses, Oregon 99 again has the highest reliability and Tualatin Sherwood Road the lowest reliability on any given day of the week. Also consistent across all corridors is the reliability being the highest on Sunday and Saturday. Let's look at some graphical output based on day of the week. So here we have some graphical output that provide the variation and planning index for all days of the week on Tualatin Valley Highway in both the east and westbound directions. On this corridor between 7.15 a.m. and 7.30 a.m., uh, there is consistently the worst reliability across all weekdays, Monday through Friday. 
the reliability on Monday is marginally higher compared to the rest of the week. For Tualatin Valley's westbound direction, the reliability is almost the same on all weekdays, and on any given day, it is relatively less reliable compared to the eastbound corridor. The eastbound direction has higher reliability on weekends compared to weekdays, specifically in the morning. However, the reliability in the westbound direction appears to be more uniform across weekdays and weekends. Notice that we've seen slight changes in trends when we've disaggregated the data a bit further to look at day of the week. Here we have graphical output showing the variation and planning index for all days of the week for the second corridor to Alton Sherwood Road. In Tualatin Sherwood Road's eastbound direction during the weekdays, Mondays have the highest reliability, while Fridays have the lowest reliability. Weekday mornings have higher reliability in the east and westbound directions. In the westbound direction, the reliability is marginally higher on Fridays. Further, for the westbound direction, the reliability appears to be higher on Friday and almost the same on the rest of the days of the week, Monday through Friday, or Monday through Thursday. The midday period appears to have the lowest reliability in the westbound direction, specifically from 11.15 a.m. to 11.30 a.m. We can see that weekends are more reliable than weekdays. Those would be the top two rows uh, where most of the shaded rectangles are a lesser color compared to the bottom five rows. Lastly, we have the variation and planning index for Oregon 99 in both the north and southbound directions. Compared to the previous two slides, uh, we can see in general Oregon 99 is more reliable. The northbound corridor has slightly higher reliability on Monday during the weekdays. And both the north and southbound directions, evening periods have the lowest reliability, with the lowest reliability period being more pronounced in the southbound direction. The southbound direction in the evening is headed away from Portland. The reliability of the northbound corridor is higher compared to the southbound corridor. One additional aspect that we looked at was weather. Does weather play a role on travel time reliability, specifically the planning index? This table presents the median travel times and mean planning index for each corridor under different weather conditions for different time periods of the day, morning, midday, and evening. The table here clearly shows that the effects of weather does not have any significant effects on travel times or travel time reliability. In some cases, the effects are also varied. There are slight increases in travel time with not sunny weather, whereas an opposite effect is seen on other corridors. These results are expected due to the time frame of our analysis, running from late summer to late fall. At this point during that year, there had been no extreme weather conditions that would affect travel times during this period. Our further analyses were conducted, including by time of day based on the planning index. However, due to time, I will not be presenting on those results today, so I will refer you to the report. Also included in the report is a segment-based analysis where various segments along each corridor are analyzed under the same time scenarios that we've considered here. In addition, these analysis that we've discussed here uh, go into much more detail and a higher synthesis in the report. So the final part of the analysis was to determine temporal effects on travel time and travel time variability. Of specific interest based on the available data were the effects of empirical peak hours, specifically morning and evening peak hours, which were determined based on the travel time data. Additionally, we included a non-peak hour indicator representing the hours of 9 p.m. to 6 a.m. To create the dependent variables for this analysis, 15-minute average travel times and 15-minute standard deviations were computed for each corridor. 
being that we created two dependent variables and aim to quantify the effects on these two dependent variables, we used a bivariate modeling approach, specifically a bivariate Tobit model. Why a bivariate model? It is likely that unobservables related to average travel time and unobservables related to travel time standard deviation are correlated. Unobservables refer to factors uh, that are unobserved to the analyst, essentially variables that you don't have in your data. Um, these are often in regression-based analysis uh, captured within the air term. So essentially in this statement, um, we're saying that the air terms can possibly be correlated. If there is correlation, consistency and efficiency of model estimates um, <clears throat> can be improved through the use of a bivariate model that is simultaneously estimating both regression equations. Now, a Tobit model is a form of linear regression that allows for censoring, and rather than parameters being estimated via least squares, they're estimated through maximum likelihood. In the case of our work, it allows us to censor a large number of zero values as it relates to travel time standard deviation. So being that we aggregated at 15 minute intervals over four months of data, there were various 15 minute intervals in which only one trip was observed, resulting in no standard deviation. To illustrate this, let's take a look at a couple of plots. Here we have two examples. Notice the large spike at zero for each plot. And although the Tualatin Valley Highway plots are not shown here, uh, the same trend was observed and those plots can also be viewed in the report. So when fitting a model, we need to apply a method that can account or censor for this large number of zeros, hence in our case the Tobit model. A model was fit for each corridor in each direction, resulting in a total of six models, each of which had a significant correlation coefficient, meaning that the bivariate approach we considered was correct. Full model specifications can be found in the report. For the remainder of this webinar, I would like to present the quantified effects by corridor based on the morning, evening, and nighttime hours. So the top table are the effects of morning peak hours on average travel time by corridor and direction. And the bottom table are the effects of morning peak hours on travel time standard deviation by corridor and direction. So referring to the top table, morning peak hours have the least effects on Oregon 99, as well as no significant effects in the southbound direction. Also with no significant effects in one direction is Tualatin Valley Highway, where no significant morning peak hour effects are observed in the westbound direction. The largest effects and each peak hour being significant in each direction happened on Tualatin and Sherwood Road. Now, if we move to the bottom table for travel time standard deviation, just three morning peak hours were found to be significant on Oregon 99, one in the northbound direction and two in the southbound direction. On Tualatin Valley Highway, no westbound morning peak hours were found to be significant and four or five eastbound morning peak hours were. Again, Tualatin Sherwood Road has the most significant peak hours with all morning peak hours other than Monday in each direction being found significant. The greater variability on Tualatin Sherwood Road is contingent on day of the week and direction. For example, standard deviation is expected to have a larger increase during the middle of the week in the westbound direction and a larger decrease in the eastbound direction on Friday. Also, through a series of two sample t-tests, it was determined that these are statistically um, different for certain days of the week in terms of direction. Let's take a look at evening peak hours. Once again, the top table represents the effects of evening peak hours on average travel time. Um, the effects represent the expected change in this case the expected increase on average travel time and the bottom table again shows the effects of evening peak hours on travel time standard deviation 
as anticipated, the evening peak hours for each day in each direction were found to be significant on each corridor. In general, the smallest increases are observed on Oregon 99, although four evening peak hours in the southbound direction do have considerable effects on average travel time. These increases might be explained by travelers electing to take Oregon 99 rather than Interstate 5 to avoid more severe congestion on the interstate. In regards to Tualatin Valley Highway, larger effects on average interval travel time are observed in the westbound direction. This is likely a result of commuters who live outside of Portland and are commuting home after work. If we look at the bottom table regarding travel time standard deviation, all evening peak hours in each direction are significant on Oregon 99, with the greater variation being observed in the southbound direction. Of the other two corridors, Tualatin Sherwood Road and Tualatin Valley Highway, just one peak hour on one corridor was found to be significant. The significant peak hour is Monday on Tualatin Sherwood Road in the eastbound direction. And lastly, here are the effects of nighttime hours on average travel time, the top table, and travel time standard deviation, the bottom table. As shown, nighttime hours substantially decrease the expected travel time, average travel times on each corridor in each direction. The greatest decrease is observed in the northbound direction on Oregon 99. <clears throat> and Tualatin and Sherwood Road, the eastbound direction has a lower expected travel time compared to the westbound direction. And then nighttime hours on Tualatin Valley Highway also have a greater impact in the eastbound direction as opposed to the westbound direction. If we look at the bottom table in terms of standard deviation, nighttime hours again substantially decrease the travel time variation or the travel time standard deviation on each corridor in each direction. Um, however, compared to average travel times, the opposite direction experiences the larger expected decrease in travel time standard deviation. For instance, Oregon 99 southbound has an expected decrease in travel time standard deviation of 42 seconds compared to 34 seconds in the northbound direction. On Tualatin Sherwood Road, the greater impact is experienced in the westbound direction with an expected decrease of 97 seconds. Lastly, on Tualatin Valley Highway, the greater impact is also experienced in the westbound direction, where travel time standard deviation expects to decrease by 78 seconds. The values in parentheses that you've seen uh, are an attempt to normalize for the different roadway lengths, so the different corridor lengths that we saw earlier in today's webinar. Uh, and those represent the average expected change per mile based on the morning, evening, and nighttime hours. So based off of this work, what can we do moving forward? I put these into two categories, one research-based and one policy and practice-based. On the research side, we can explore additional outlier methods. This can include identifying travel time distributions and using distribution-based outlier analysis methods. Another can include a time series-based outlier analysis. Another option can be exploring the construction of confidence intervals for the reliability metrics. Lastly, we can continue data evaluation and comparison. For instance, how does Bluetooth data compare to HEAR data or NRICS data or other private data sources? On the policy and practice side, we can investigate signal timing strategies along corridors with low reliability and high increases in expected travel time. Is there currently adaptive phasing? Can we improve the trade-off between the major and minor approaches in terms of phase length? Another avenue is to promote alternate modes of transportation, such as active transport and or public transportation. As we saw earlier, each corridor has numerous transit stops. Also, being located in Oregon, there are various bike facilities, and several recent safety improvements have been made throughout the area, specifically in the interest of cyclists. Lastly, there can be project-based solutions, such as increasing capacity or updating infrastructure to accommodate, for example, active transport through the addition of multi-use paths or widening bike lanes. One example on Tualatin Sherwood Road, a project begins next year uh, to increase capacity um, for the eastern part of the road. So 
with that, that concludes today's webinar. I'd like to thank all of you for being interested in this topic and, and joining us today for this. Um, at this time, Brendan, uh, I'd be more than happy to take some questions. Yeah, thanks a lot, Jason. Um, there is time to submit questions still. Um, use the questions uh, box on the uh, webinar, go to webinar. Um, but yeah, uh, Jason, I was, um, you know, obviously thinking through your presentation of all the time spent in slow traffic and, uh, sure. the, you know, you're studying three corridors outside of Portland. Um, so it's sort of a general issue for all of us, but then, uh, you know, you studied a specific area. Can you just talk a little bit more about how your research can be used, um, perhaps in, in other states? And, and Certainly. And, yeah. Certainly. So the framework, the methodological frameworks that we applied to this study are certainly spatially transferable, meaning if you have the travel time data um, and the area of interest, uh, maybe it's a metro area of Chicago um, or Atlanta, for example, um, the methods employed in this work are spatially transferable to other areas, <clears throat> um, including the outlier analysis, the reliability metrics recommended by Federal Highway, and, and also the econometric-based analysis that I focused on at the end of the webinar. Um, all of those methods are spatially transferable, assuming that you're able to collect the travel time data in the area of interest. All right, and so, I, it's my understanding that Washington County appreciated uh, the removal of the outliers. Can you talk about how um, that was identified as a, a, a piece of the research? Certainly, yeah, that was, um, in talking with Washington County, um, a big aspect for them was a more efficient, uh, robust way to be able to account for outliers. Uh, and I mentioned that in today's webinar, um, is that uh, most traditional outlier detection methods and, and a lot employed throughout the country are based on distributional assumptions. Um, so they're limiting in some way. <clears throat> uh, so for them, uh, us generating or adopting a previously used outlier detection method um, that didn't rely on distributional assumptions and that could better identify outliers was very important to them and so that's how that stemmed into the research uh, i'd also like to say that um, even though they were very interested in that played a role um, quality control of data um, whether outlier analysis or removing erroneous um, observations is always very important in any data-driven analysis that's done Great. Okay, so I have a, a question from the audience. Um, is our understanding that BlueMac data has historical data within their travel time data? Did you remove the historical data? Um, I'm not sure what they're referring to as historical data, um, but the, over the last couple of years, um, they've been putting them up, maintaining them. And so the travel time observations were mostly sparse throughout the county uh, with high traffic corridors being ones that had, if they're referring to historical data, going back a couple of years. <clears throat> there also weren't very many attributes available in the data other than timestamps and then um, average speed and average travel time. Okay, a uh, couple more. Um, how does the travel time reliability or lack of reliability impact incentives for individuals to shift away from peak hour travel, spread the peak, and subsequently improve the cost efficiency of capacity improvements? I think that's a great question. Uh, and it's ultimately a person to person um, preference. Uh, I commute myself um, uh, on Oregon 99 uh, every day to Portland State University and I drive by myself in peak hours. And when I look around, I see multiple other people uh, driving 
by themselves during peak hours. Um, I personally would consider active tra or, uh, public transportation, but there is no public transportation route that runs from uh, my neighborhood to where I work. And so I think the availability of public transit um, for a lot of people in this specific area uh, plays a role. Uh, a lot of people live in the metropolitan, the surrounding areas and then work in Portland or downtown Portland, but the bus routes only go out so far. And at a certain distance, it becomes, you have to weigh off a trade uh, convenience versus time. And a lot of people are choosing convenience to be able to just drive themselves. Um, and then in terms of alternate modes of transportation, uh, specifically uh, active transport, I think Oregon specifically does does a great job at promoting bicycles, for example. Uh, we have great facilities, um, great safety features at intersections, uh, and you actually see a lot of people, um, especially closer to the Portland area, um, commuting via bicycle. Uh, can you speak to the use of this type of analysis to support or preclude changes to roadway capacity? For example, travel lane removal for bikeways or transit only lanes? That's a, that's a great question. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to refer back to the, um, the results that we found on Tualatin Sherwood Road. Um, of the three, we found that the reliability metrics were substantially higher compared to the other, to the other corridors. And then through the econometric based analysis, the expected increases in travel time during the morning and the evening were substantial also compared to the other corridors. Uh, and it just so happened that this uh, corridor is undergoing a capacity expansion project that I begin is, is beginning next year. So I would say that these methods can certainly identify problem areas in terms of reliability or expected increases in travel time. Um, but the addition of capacity, I think, is very contingent on the area. Um, <clears throat> is there the land to be able to do it and would require some simulation-based approaches to determine if the addition of uh, capacity would actually improve travel time reliability or travel times and expected increases of travel time? All right, um, so we, we do have clarification about the, the Blue Mac data. Um, okay. The person is saying uh, that their understanding is that they use data from other days to fill in the data gaps if they don't have an, enough data within uh, one day. Okay, uh, yeah, from my understanding and uh, having worked with the data for several, several months, um, there were a lot of instances where the data was incomplete, um, although not directly asking Washington County after seeing the data myself, I would assume that that process was not done on the data that we use for this project. Great, great. Okay, uh, any other questions? Uh, we still have time. All right, well, um, Jason, I'd like to thank you so much for your presentation. Um, thank you. I'd like to remind everyone that we have a Friday transportation seminar coming up this Friday. Um, and we also have another webinar on December 3rd. Thanks for joining us and hopefully you'll uh, attend another one of our events soon.